invite you to look with me this evening to this familiar verse that has so oft times challenged our hearts. Acts chapter 1, verse 8. With every passing day this week, I'm reminded of the thoughtfulness and the preparation. And just thinking back to uh, supper time, not just tonight, but uh, each night, the fellowship there round about the table. And this evening, the brother putting too much ice cream in my bowl. It made me smile. <laughs> Earlier today, we were headed out to Frankenmuth to the Christmas village. And I don't know how the preacher does it. Y'all got good connections around here. But just as we were pulling out of the parking lot, heading over to the Christmas village, the snowflakes started falling on, on the windshield. <laughs> but in so many ways, you've been thoughtful. And uh, uh, you've shown the connections that you've had, and I know, I know you've prayed for, for these meetings. When a church gives themselves to faith promise giving, they stand in amazement as they watch the Lord transform their church, their families, their lives. They experience that growth of faith the preacher was describing. My friend, God still smiles on a people who will just trust him. Faith promise giving is very personal. Getting alone with God and saying, Lord, I want to be your channel. God so much still longs for a channel through whom he might reach out to the world. You are that channel. Lord, I want to be a channel. I look not merely to my resources. I look to your pleasure, what you desire, to give through me, your channel. Let me be that channel. It's very personal. And of course, it's congregational. You get alone, alone with the Lord and you say, Lord, I want to be that channel. And God works in your own heart. I look at this commitment card. I'm impressed how that there are certain amounts that are listed and it even shows what those amounts can accomplish. And yet, even the smallest amount can have a great impact. You get along with the Lord with this faith promise, commitment, and yes, encourage your children to have a part in some way. I still remember how that my girls would uh, come to me if they were not able to be with me on a certain journey. They would sometimes bring their, their piggy banks, their, their coins, and they would say, Daddy, uh, this is for the crusade, Daddy. And then in the years that followed, I saw the Lord work in their lives, but I can look back to those moments when they showed tenderness of heart and wanted to be a part of what the Lord was doing. Get alone with the Lord and yield yourself as that channel as you fill out this faith promise commitment that has no place for your name. Nobody's going to come knocking on your door. But here's the congregational part. As you fill out this card and they're received. And then the church realizes what has been pledged individually, though your name is not given. Then as a church, you can rejoice together in what you can do as a church. 
And you can go forward and say, by God's grace, we're going to claim this shore and that shore and, and the further shore and send these ambassadors and, and those. And so get alone with the Lord. Be that channel that God so much wants to use. And then as a church, watch as the Lord smiles upon you and does through you even more than what you had dared to ask. We find ourselves at times grieving over the doors that are closing. My heart has been heavy in recent days. I shared it with you last night. As I am watching heavy shadows fall in regions where so often times I have traveled through the years. Yet at the same time, as we think of those doors and we remember even Hong Kong, how that not many years ago, so easily we could step into that region and labor. I did not personally go there, but I found myself grieving, as did others, when the liberty began to fade there in that place where we had presumed upon opportunity that had been ours for so long. And yet, even as we grieve over doors that are closing, we rejoice in remembering that God can still open the doors that men call closed. And even more obvious are doors that are opening right before us. In the country of Myanmar, only five years ago or so, that land that still many will call Burma, that country only about five years ago was held in the tight grasp of a military regime. But they are enjoying liberty, and we having liberty there, that they have not known for generations. So easily we can enter that country now. For as long as I've been going to that part of the world, I've been training those who came from Myanmar, who sought their college education and then returned to their own country. Now I have the privilege of laboring with them in their own Bible colleges there within their country. The Lord is doing marvelous things. There is so much liberty that is there. For how long? I do not know. But let us do what we must while we can. I think of doors that are closed. But I see the windows. I think of China. I have a radio broadcast with FBN, Fundamental Broadcasting Network, on Saturday evenings. It's called The Voice of Vision. It's aired on their international network, but it's a privilege to partner with them now in providing this internet radio platform that will offer besides the radio stream, programming in various languages of Southeast Asia within that 1040 window, that region of the world where most of the unreached peoples of humanity live. We will actually interrupt the radio stream with programming that will include uh, various uh, languages in Myanmar, uh, the Chin language, and uh, in just a few months we'll add to that the Burmese language. Now please understand, most of the Christians of Myanmar, they come from certain groups of that country like the Chin people and the Karen people. Uh, you remember them from Adonardam Judson's story. But among the Burmese-speaking people, 
most all of them are Buddhist. In fact, among the Burmese-speaking people of Myanmar, less than 1% are Christian. So we are excited about not only being able to provide programming in the Chin language, but then also very soon in the Burmese language. And after the first of the year, uh, we're looking forward to launching programming in the Mandarin language of China, uh, partnering with uh, dear missionaries there in, um, in Beijing. I think you said you supported them. Uh, we're going to be partnering with Brother Eddie Ray in, in his ministry. I spent some, year, uh, some, some, some hours with him uh, just, just over the last couple of weeks ago. You know, there, there's a, a silver lining to this dark cloud we call COVID. Uh, a lot of the missionaries that would usually be on that side of the world, they're stuck on this side of the world. Well, guess what? It gives us opportunity to get together and plan and scheme and set our strategy and I've been able to get together with some brethren that otherwise, usually, uh, I'd have to go a world away just to be able to see. That's a wonderful silver lining to this dark cloud. So please pray as we're going forward in these efforts. Would you stand together with me tonight if you're able? If you'd stand together with me tonight. As I read again those familiar words in Acts chapter 1, verse 8. The Lord, before he departed from his disciples, gathered there on the summit of Mount Olivet. He said to them, But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost is come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea, and in Samaria, and unto the uttermost part of the earth. Let's pray. Father, I ask that you'd speak to our hearts once again. Please, Lord, stir us with that passion that was first first kindled in such fervent heat in your own heart. Please, Lord, cause our hearts to beat in tune with your own. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thank you, and you may be seated. Before the church made any boast of their own buildings or even considered the possibility of a budget. The Lord said, but you shall receive power. He said, you will be witnesses even unto the uttermost part of the earth. Someone has rightly described the missions conference as being that business meeting during which the church gathers and together decides the fate of the world. My friend, do not dismiss the solemn spirit that ought be evident in these meetings. Yes, the rejoicing, but also the trembling as we realize that what we will do, we must do now, right now. I've spent much of my ministry entering into countries that men would call closed where missionaries are not welcome. We have to be very careful how we introduce ourselves, describe our reason for being there. Sometimes a person has suspected us of being there because we're American, being there for 
business. And so if they look at us and with an inquisitive eye, they, they ask, a, a business? And I look at them and I say in reply, big business. <laughs> and they say, oh, as they walk away. My friend, this is the biggest business, and it is our business. And let us show ourselves busy. Consider first our door to the world. Our door to the world. I remind you, when Jesus said, both in Jerusalem and all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth, that word both means all at once and at the same time. He did not say, first Jerusalem, then Judea, and then he said both, all at one, and at the same time. While you're reaching out to those souls that are nearest you, reach out to those shores that are furthest away, all at once, and at the same time. While you're Reaching across the street, you're reaching across the sea all at once and at the same time. Roman soldiers had crucified my Savior, but that same Roman Empire had paved the roads that would be trod soon by the feet of missionaries. But I tell you, dear friend, there has never been a day like our day. No generation could ever say, as we can. My friend, we have a door to the world. Generations past would have not been able to, with their most exaggerated imagination, be able to conjure in their thoughts those opportunities that we so oftentimes take for granted. With the dawn of the internet and our smartphones as we call them, I remember years ago how that I was sitting with my dad waiting for his doctor's appointment. And I was just kind of spending my time staring down at my phone. He asked me, he said, what are you looking at? I said, I'm spying on Russia. I was, by the way. He laughed at me. I said, no, really. I said, look. I said, that's Red Square. There's the Kremlin right there. Uh, I was uh, looking at Google Maps, Google Earth. You know, just a few years ago, people would have looked at us and said, Google what? I said, I'm spying on Russia. My friend, a generation ago would not have imagined the... When I pastored over in Dover, Delaware for a short time, I was so excited about getting our website on the Internet. I thought to myself, now we're going to be able to reach across the bay and let folks know in Maryland what we're doing over here. And I was overjoyed to get an email from Africa. <laughs> a man said, I read the gospel on your website and I trusted Christ as my Savior. And that story has been told so many times by pastors on this side of the world about what happened on the other side of the world. God's given us a door to the world. He said all at once and at the same time. Not long ago, I saw a presentation, it was televised. There was a person who was standing here, but then also standing here. The one was flesh and bone, the other a holographic image. And they begin to describe how that holographic image could represent that person a world away. Now, I don't know when the church will be allowed that technology. <laughs> I'm just saying, dear friend, whenever was there a generation who could say as we can, we have a door to the world. 
Elon Musk with all of his other dark ideas, and my friend, they are very dark. <laughs> he is putting satellites in orbit so that all of humanity can have access. You know, as countries are closing right before our eyes, they're opening doors of opportunity and allowing us to reach into places where, in fact, we can never go. Whenever was there a day like our day when we could say the Lord has given us a door to the world? Jesus said to them both in Jerusalem, all Judea and Samaria, and the uttermost part of the earth, all at once, at the same time, while you're reaching, reaching out to Samaria, then beyond to the furthest, most reaches of humanity. I travel a lot. And because I travel as much as I do, every now and then, the airlines, they let me take what they call a free trip. I don't have to pay for the journey. It was a trip to the Philippines when I took one of those trips. Wasn't going to cost me anything. I was on the island of Negros in Bacolid City. Would you believe that they flew me from the island of Negros to Manila on the island of Luzon? And then from Manila, they flew me to Incheon, Korea. I still believe the most direct route between two points is a straight line. From Bacola to Manila, on the island of Luz, to Incheon, Korea, to Tokyo, Japan. They then flew me from Tokyo, Japan to Los Angeles, California. Next, from Los Angeles, California to Detroit, Michigan. And finally, from Detroit, Michigan, to Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. I thought to myself, you did that on purpose. <laughs> then I found myself rejoicing. I thought to myself, whenever was there a day when we could so easily step from one continent to the next continent and skip across the waves without getting our feet wet? What other generation could say as we can, we have a door to the world. But I think not only of our door to the world, but I think about the world at our door. Jesus said both in Jerusalem and all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth, but in just a few days, it was on the day of Pentecost, so many nations had gathered at Jerusalem. It was not long after that that Philip, the only man who's actually called an evangelist in Scripture, though called an evangelist is doing the work of a missionary, Jerusalem, Judea, he's in Samaria, and then he's pursuing after an Ethiopian eunuch, which to the Jewish mind reminded them of the uttermost reaches of humanity. But that Ethiopian eunuch was not in Africa. He had come to Israel. Oh, I remember, my friend, the testimony of Israel in the Old Testament and the nations being drawn. And, and, and I understand, and I'm not for a moment confusing us with, with Israel. But I will say to you, No other nation like our nation can speak of how the world has been drawn to our very door. I understand the complications and I understand that difficult decisions need to be made in regards to immigration. Don't get me wrong, but hear me. In the midst of the fray, in the midst of the distress, just take a moment and rejoice over the fact that God has brought the world to our door.
we have a door to the world, but we have the world at our door. I was at a church just recently. This church. We're leaving the parking lot. I saw a sign that said, you're entering the mission field. God's, oh, pray that you'll be able to send more missionaries. But lift your eyes and realize you're surrounded by the world. Look to cities like New York and Los Angeles and even Detroit, Michigan. And see those metropolises to be microcosms of the entire world as the nations have gathered together in those communities, in this very country. God has brought the world to our door. I remember when I was pastoring, how that we took such delight in having a ministry as a family would go to Dunkin' Donuts. The Indian gentleman there, his name was Bobby. He took special delight in our girls and would put some extra little donuts there in the bag every time we went. We'd go to the Mexican restaurant. That's my wife's favorite. To the Chinese, you notice how all this has to do with food. It's a wonderful thing. Went to the Chinese restaurant one day. I said to my wife, I said, they're playing Christian music. Would you believe the man came over to the table? He said, I'm doing this for you. I'm playing the music for you, for you. Do you like it? Do you like it? Just a moment. There's a telephone call. He took the telephone call. He looked at me. He said, amen. Big crowd coming. And then he did this over his heart. No, he wasn't a Christian, but I hope maybe we had some influence Perhaps we'll see him in heaven. Be a wonderful thing if he greeted us at the pearly gate. I am saying this to you, dear friend. Look around you. Opportunity abounds. We went to Frankenmuth today. Walking down the sidewalk. I pulled away from some of the others because I saw a gentleman that I recognized to be a Sikh from India. And we spoke for a few moments. We talked for a little bit. Even just today. I found the world at my door. My wife and I, we were in a city some years ago, and we just started counting the languages uh, that, that we uh, met uh, during that day, just those few hours, just among those who, who worked uh, in, in the shops, not even speaking to the customers. We counted eight languages. You say, sure, in New York City. My friend, this was Pigeon Forge, Tennessee. God has brought the world to our door. I take great delight in giving the answer when some have asked me, and even this week it has happened, uh, where's your family from? And I tell them, a little town called North South Carolina. It's not in the northern part of the state. It's in the southern part of the state, but it's called North South Carolina. My family's from that little town of North South Carolina, a town with only one stoplight, and I'm not sure why we have it. 300 people, they needed a mayor. My uncle said, I'll run for mayor. And they said, good, you're him. <laughs> we enjoy a home for a little while each year. They're in North South Carolina. That is, no kidding, on Westview Drive in North South Carolina. On the east end of Westview Drive in North South Carolina. You say, preacher, what's all that foolishness about? In that little town of 300 people in one stoplight, there are three gas stations. I don't know why we need so many. But at least two of them are owned by Indian families. Don't tell me, dear friend. Well, we're rural and surrounded by a cornfield, and that message just doesn't fit around here. God's brought the world to our door. A family who was Sikh by religion left the country of India only a generation ago. They settled in a little town of South Carolina. Their daughter grew up among us, 
thankfully heard of Christ and now professes to be a Christian. One day, she became a governor and then the ambassador for the United States to the UN. Her name is Nikki Haley. Only one generation removed from her home country. God has brought the world to our door. And I wonder to myself, how long will it be when those who step on my shoulder, how long will it be before they hear the name of Jesus Christ? Gandhi, that great leader of India, he was so close to becoming a Christian. When he was a barrister, we would say an attorney in South Africa, one day he decided that he would go to a church for this purpose, not only to talk to the preacher about the hunger of his own soul, but he wanted to talk with that preacher about the troubles of India, the caste system that broke his heart. And Gandhi thought to himself, this person, Jesus Christ, I believe might be the answer for not only my soul, but for all of India. One day, even years later, Gandhi, in preparing for a speech that he would deliver before a great crowd, he said to his organizer of the event, he said, I want you to sing that favorite Christian song of mine, that hymn that I cherish. And the man looked at him, wanting some, some hint as to the him of which he was speaking and Gandhi said you know the one that says when I survey the wondrous cross on which the prince of glory died my richest gain I count but loss and poor contempt on all my pride see from his head his hands his feet sorrow and love folk mingled down did e'er such love and sorrow meet our thorns compose so rich a favorite hymn of Gandhi and I ask you how can a man approach so close to the cross of Christ and turn away and step into a Christless eternity? How can it be? When he was in South Africa, he thought, I'm going to go talk to that preacher about the need of my own soul and the need of India. I believe Christ may be the answer. But when he stepped up to the door that day, a man greeted him at the threshold, and when he saw Gandhi's dark skin, he looked at that dark-skinned man standing in front of him because the church had been established by Europeans that established their settlement in South Africa. Gandhi standing there at the door. He's greeted by this man that seeing his dark skin said to Gandhi, your people worship in another church. And Gandhi walked away that day and said, if Christianity has its own caste system, then why should I cease to be a Hindu? I would not want to be standing near that man when he gives account for turning away the world that stood at his door. Not only a soul that was hungry, but a leader of India who was seeking the answer for an entire nation. All oh, the accountability. God has brought the world to our door. Oh, that we'd feel the accountability. And knowing that God has brought the world to our door, I assure you, there is a divine appointment that awaits you. Maybe even tomorrow. How oftentimes have we looked back on those moments and we have confessed, I think I missed a divine appointment. You may never go to the other side of the world, but my friend, God's brought the world to your door. 
And one day, very soon, even as it happened to me today, a man from there will cross your path. God has brought the world to our door. Oh, that you might get along with God, maybe even fall on your face before Him tonight and say, Lord, I want to be ready for that next divine appointment. My daughter, college student, Flying back to college years ago. She sits beside a gentleman who is obviously Indian. She just so happens to sit beside this gentleman who is obviously Indian. Who identifies himself as being an executive with Yahoo. Now, to see such a man in the computer industry, in the high-tech world, a man who exists in such high echelons, my friend, you would have to make an appointment unless the Lord just put it on the schedule for a young lady who is just a college student to sit beside him that day. He said, I'm an executive with Yahoo. Now, down south, we have this wonderful chocolate drink called Yoohoo. And as we've traveled, my family has taken great delight in discovering that many others drink it around the country as well. So when this Indian executive said to my daughter, I work for Yahoo. My daughter looked back at him and said, Wow, do you get all the chocolate drink that you want? <laughs> and he said, Yahoo, not Yahoo, computers, not chocolate drink. But don't you be very surprised when perhaps an Indian gentleman walks up to you in heaven and says, I'm the Yahoo man. My friend, there is a divine appointment that awaits you. If not tomorrow, very soon, we not only have a door to the world, but we discover that the world is at our door. We are accountable not only to send the missionary, but to be the missionary. If you go no further than across the street, you'll find out they don't just live anymore yonder across the seas. They're not just other nations. They're your neighbors. I understand the difficult decisions that need to be made in our day. Don't misinterpret my words. But I am saying, in this moment when so many are distressed, just take a little bit of time and rejoice that God has brought the world to our door. How oftentimes a man had to leave his country to hear of Christ. That occasion when this man left India and he was sailing to Canada, but on that ship, this man, who like Nikki Haley's family, was Sikh, but lived long before, he thought to himself, I respect all religions, so I'm going to go to this Christian church service. He attended the Christian church service, and he thought that he would stay just for a little while, and then he would slip out while these Christians were praying. But when he stepped out of his seat, and he was going to sneak away, he found out that during the prayer, the Christians had knelt all about him and blocked the way. He wasn't going anywhere. So he knelt down among them. And God broke his heart. He got baptized in a Baptist church in Canada. That man, Bhakti Singh, went back to India and became one of the greatest preachers that nation has ever known. I still meet those who were saved through his ministry. They tell me how that the streets of Hyderabad, they were 
throng with the multitudes that, that paraded in celebration of his life and the Lord took him home. How oftentimes a person has left their country to hear of Christ in another country and it might be that person that crosses paths with you. I go to the distant yonder. I rejoice that we have such a, a door to the world. I have literally flown over the Atlantic at least 50 times and over the Pacific about 10 times. And that's the door we have to the world in this day. Missionaries, generations past, would spend sometimes six months on board a ship. And when they landed on the shores, they discovered it was not the shores that they had intended to call their destination. But even though I have ventured far and I step behind the pulpit, oftentimes it's on the way to a meeting before the service takes place that God gives me that wonderful divine appointment. We were traveling to eastern Pennsylvania. I've often through the years preached in a tent meeting in that city. And on the way to Easton, my wife said to me, she said, uh, I want this um, certain muffin. They're called Susie Muffins. And she said, we have to go to Wegmans grocery store to get them. So we just turned over off to the side for this brief errand, a short stop on the way to the meeting. We're walking down the aisles of this grocery store looking for Susie Muffins. A gentleman offers to help us. We mention our heart's desire. He doesn't know where they are, but he helps us to find them. Kind gentleman. We get our Susie Muffins, and then we get an ice cream treat to enjoy. We walk out of the store. We sit down there at the tables. We look over at a young lady who's sitting close by. On her mug, there are these words about global missions. We have to speak. I tell her about Southeast Asia and where we labor. She said, oh, she said, I love that country. She said, it can't be. We travel onwards. The meetings begin. First night I preach after the service. It was some distance away from Wegmans where we had stopped. Some distance away. It was not a short drive. First night after the sermon, a gentleman came up to me and said, he's standing this close to me. He said, you don't recognize me, do you? I hate it when people do that. You don't recognize me, do you? And I said, I am sorry, sir. I said, I meet so many people. I said, I apologize. He said, Susie Muffins. And I looked again and focused and realized it was that man that had helped us in the aisle there at the Wegmans. Two nights later, that young lady that we had met, she shows up at the tent meeting. Aren't you glad when visitors come, but they're not content to come alone, but they bring visitors themselves? And she begins to introduce her friends. She points to one, and then she points to another, and she says, this young man is from Japan. She said, I don't know how long he's going to be here. He doesn't understand much English. I stepped up to the platform and I told the people, I said, this young man doesn't know it yet, but God brought him all the way to this side of the world just to be in this meeting tonight, and I believe that. After the service, I went back there and I thanked them for coming. The young lady said, my friend from Japan, 
He asks us, what is this thing born again? And so I got to explain and watch that young man with tears in his eyes bow his head and trust Christ as his Savior. Soon he made his way back toward Japan, having come to this side of the world to hear of Jesus Christ. I tell you, Susie Muffins, one of my favorite muffins now. How many divine appointments have we missed? When will the next one happen? We have a door to the world. But God has brought the world to our door. Oh, the accountability that falls upon us. Yes, to send missionaries across the seas. But for us to have the heart to go across the street. To meet that person who even without going to their door stands at our door, who crosses our path. Would you dare pray, dear friend, God, help me to be ready for that next divine appointment. Because it's going to happen. It's going to happen. It won't be Gandhi standing at the door. But it'll be another. It's going to happen. Whenever could a generation say like our day, we have a door to the world. Whenever has there been a nation who could say, the world is at our door. Jesus said, both in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth, all at once and at the same time. While you're crossing the seas, don't forget to cross the street. 